Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. In the last couple of lectures, we've looked at state variable filters as a way to implement second order filters. Here we're going to look at another structure called Salen Key as another method of implementing second order filters. So here's an extremely boring second order filter. I do have two capacitors, so that will give me two poles. It takes a bit of work to derive the transfer function for this filter and figure out where the poles are. It is definitely not the pole defined by this RC combo and then the pole defined by this RC combo. Because there's no buffering, essentially this RB and CG load down the filter created by RA and CF, and the math for that gets a bit messy. The triangle here is just a simple voltage buffer, and you'll see why I put that there in a slide or two. Now, you could make the math easier by putting in a second buffer, in which case you really just have one pole defined by this RC and another pole defined by this RC. In the case of this filter, you could set the R's and the C's together and have the poles landing together in the same spot to create a critically damped second order function. In the version over here, you'll wind up with the poles spread out along the real axis. But in any case, neither of these can give you complex poles, which is what we need to have an interesting filter. So what we're going to do in this lecture is a little trick. We're going to take the output and feed it back in place of the ground of this capacitor that we called CF. This is a trick called bootstrapping. So in addition to creating that feedback, let me also put a gain factor of K here. Now most descriptions of the solid key filter you'll see just have a straight line here and they'll put the K here and define the output here. For my purposes here, I prefer to separate this and take the output before that gain of K. I'm using A and B here because we're just kind of reading left to right. I'm calling the CF since it's a capacitor in the feedback loop and I'm calling this CG since it's a capacitor to ground. Later we'll look at a high pass version of this, in which case calling this a capacitor to ground won't be an accurate statement, but I'm going to call this capacitor CG anyway. So in terms of the canonical low pass function that we specified in terms of a natural frequency omega and a quality factor Q, you can go through a ton of math and discover that the natural frequency is given by the square root of the product of the resistances and the capacitances. And Q is given by this insanely complicated formula here. The main thing to notice at this point is that Q is a function of everything, the resistances and the amount of feedback, whereas the natural frequency is not a function of K. It's only a function of the resistances and capacitances. There's a variation of this filter based on doing the bootstrap trick on this version of the circuit on the right that looks quite similar. And I started searching for a name for this configuration ages ago when I was studying the filter in the MS-20, or at least one of the versions of the MS-20. And I finally found a paper by someone named Bach no, not that Bach, different Bach. Anyway, the natural frequency of this Bach variation is the same as what I'm now calling the original Solon key. And when people say Solon key, they're generally referring to this particular version, unless they're talking about the MS-20, in which case they'll just call it a Solon key, not recognizing that there is this difference here with this first buffer. We'll take a look at that in detail later in the lecture. The Bach variation is almost the same. The main difference is that this RACG term that's present in the Solon key version is not present in the Bach version, but the other two terms are the same. These formulas are a handful. We could simplify them greatly if we were to say, let the capacitances be the same, or say, let the resistances be the same. Here I'm going to let the resistances be the same, and the nice thing that happens there is that these resistances combine into an R squared that pull out of the square root as just an R, and then that winds up canceling with all of the various R's down here. So we wind up with an expression where the Q's are only a function of the capacitances and the feedback K. I'm using a capital K here to distinguish it from the lowercase K we used in the lectures on the four pole with feedback structure. The resulting difference between the original Solon key and Bach... No, not you. Go away, JS.
Anyway, now the difference between these two versions is that there is a two in front of the CG in the original cell and key formula, but there's no two in the Bach variation. Now, remember Q needs to be positive in order to have a stable filter. If Q is negative, that means you wind up with a pole to the right of the imaginary axis. Now, the need for this denominator to be bigger than zero in either case places some constraints on K. In this version of the filter with the resistors being the same, we wind up with this relationship that says for the cell and key version, K needs to be less than. This formula here with the two in front of this CG over CF factor, whereas in the Bach variation, we wind up with the same kind of formula, except there's not a two in front of this CG over CF. Cell and key filters are an extremely common go-to design for when somebody needs a low-pass or high-pass filter with fixed characteristics. There's fairly standard design procedures for choosing the components to get a particular omega n and a particular q. And if you need a filter that has a fixed q, but a cutoff that you can vary with a pot, it's quite common to use a ganged potentiometer that allows the user to change both these resistances at once. And come to think of it, I've seen that in the external signal processor of the Korg MS-20. And wow, this pot actually changes four resistances with one knob. In all of these formulations, the gain K is usually implemented using an op amp in a non-inverting configuration. Of course, the next most obvious step in our road towards simplification would be to let the capacitors be the same, in which case the natural frequency just reduces to 1 over RC, and we have simple expressions for Q of 3 minus K and 2 minus K for the original and Bach variations. Notice that for Q to be positive, we would need K to be less than 3 for the original version, and for Q to be positive in the Bach case, we need K to be less than 2. The other thing to notice is that increasing K increases Q. Decreasing K decreases Q. I can't emphasize enough that this is opposite the role of feedback in the state variable filter. In the state variable filter, the natural structure is oscillating. It's extremely high Q and you introduce negative feedback from that first stage to provide dampening in the transfer function. The feedback was proportional to 1 over Q in the state variable filter, so increasing feedback decreases Q in the state variable filter, which is opposite of what we have here with the sal and key. Also remember that you could pretty much pick any Q you wanted for the state variable filter, whereas since there's also a limit on K being positive, the smallest Q you can get out of the original version is one-third, and the smallest Q you could get out of the Bach version is one-half. And this feels intuitive because if you set K equal to zero in the Bach version, that basically grounds this capacitor, and here you would have two identical one-pole filters cascaded. We presented the state variable filter with this high-level block diagram that was amenable to a lot of different implementations. The cell and key filter is a much more circuitsy kind of thing. There are ways to try to express it with high-level block diagrams, but they don't seem to be terribly illuminating to me, so we're just going to get down and dirty with the circuits. We'll take one of the approaches we used in the single-pole OTAC lecture and replace the resistors with operational transconductance amplifiers. For this, we will use the Bach variation, and I'll explain a little later about why this doesn't work as well with the original cell and key. So here I've copied the Bach version of the filter. The natural frequency is 1 over R times the square root of 1 over the product of the capacitances. And the Q is this expression with the capacitances and the feedback gain. If I take this resistor and this resistor and replace them with OTAs, I get this kind of structure. The first OTA here will produce a current going up this branch and then into this capacitor that matches the current that winds up going into the capacitor up here. You can imagine that this resistor is sensing the voltage here and the voltage at this node just the same way that the OTA senses the voltage here and the voltage at this node. Similarly, there's going to be a current being dumped down through this capacitor to ground. 
And you can imagine that this resistor is looking at the voltage here and the voltage at the junction of the resistor and the capacitor and is using Ohm's law to come up with an associated current. Here we have the OTA doing a similar kind of calculation by looking at the voltage at the output of the buffer here and the voltage at the negative terminal that corresponds to the voltage at this node. The convenient thing about having the buffer here in the Bach version is that there's no current flowing through here, so we don't have to worry about the fact that there's no current flowing through here. Now there's technically a difference in what's happening at the input, but as we saw in the case of the one-pole OTAC configuration, if we assume that the voltage sources here are perfect, it doesn't really matter that there is current flowing through this side of the resistor in the original circuit, but there's no current flowing through here in the version where we replace the resistors with OTAs, because the voltage source is considered perfect and the fact that there's an infinite input impedance here and some non-infinite input impedance here doesn't really matter. Now, the issue of what this OTA here is doing would matter in this original Sal and Key version. Our OTA could only model what was happening with the current coming out of the right side of the resistor here. In the original Sal and Key, there is a current flowing through the left side here, and that plays a role in what's happening with this node here, but the OTA can't deal with that. If you really wanted to try to use OTAs to emulate what the original Sal and Key circuit does, you would sort of have to have two OTAs back to back, with one OTA pointed this way and another OTA pointed the other direction in order to deal with the current flowing through that side. But that's overly complicated. Once we've made these transformations, we can replace the reciprocal of the resistance with the transconductance gain of the OTAs that we usually approximate as 19.2 times the control current going into the current control pins of the OTA. And here we're assuming we're feeding both of these the same control current. Let me take the structure on the lower right and copy it onto the upper left corner of the next slide. Following one of the transformations we made in the one-pole OTAC lecture, instead of taking the local feedback for the OTAs from the outputs of the OTAs, we could instead take the feedback from the outputs of these voltage buffers, giving us this in the lower right-hand corner. And again, following what we did in the one-pole OTAC lecture, we recognize that OTAs have a very limited differential input range in which they act relatively linear. So we can introduce these voltage dividers to cut down the voltage before they hit the OTA. Notice here we're using the same R small and R big values for the dividers on all of the inputs. And conveniently, since we're using the same amount of attenuation for both of the inputs for each OTA, we can take that attenuation and just pile that into the gain of the OTA. And making our usual R big plus R small equals R big approximation, we come up with a formula for the natural frequency that looks like this. Since we're taking the input into the positive terminal of this OTA, this overall structure is non-inverting. If we wanted to, we could take the input and plug it into the negative input of the OTA. That wouldn't change any of the rest of the behavior of the filter other than sticking a minus sign in front of the transfer function. Now, if we do that, one trick we can pull is to have this feedback loop and this input share this R small. And that would look a little something like this. In order to eventually get to the same kind of formula for the natural frequency, we also need to make another approximation, namely that a big resistance and a small resistance in parallel is approximately the small resistance. And that sort of comes up if we think of a superposition argument and imagine grounding R big if we're looking at it from the standpoint of the voltage coming in this direction and having R big in parallel with R small, or if we imagine temporarily grounding R big on this side to figure out what things look like from the point of view of the input, in which case from this side, we would be seeing an R big in parallel with an R small. Actually working that out in detail takes a bit of work, but this is close enough for rock and roll. So let's take a look at the VCF in the Korg MS-20. And in particular, we'll look at the low-pass version for now. And in particular, I want to actually start with a variation of this filter by Rene Schmitz because his schematic is a whole lot easier to read than the original Korg schematics.
So we have the main filter core down here, but I want to first talk a little bit about the exponential voltage to current conversion circuit here. He's using PMP transistors because we need to provide a current source for the OTAs instead of a current sink like we did in the VCO designs that we looked at. We have an op amp that is holding this terminal at the collector of the transistor on the left at a virtual ground. So that virtual ground and this minus 15 volts gives us a reference current flowing this direction defined by this 470K resistor and Ohm's law. One thing you would need to be careful of is the fact that this current source is actually split between the two OTAs. So if you calculate that you need the OTAs to have a certain current, well, this transistor up here needs to provide twice that. The 4.7 nanofarad capacitor you see in the local feedback loop for A4 isn't terribly important. It's just there for stability purposes. Now, in some previous lectures, when we looked at these NPN-based exponential voltage-to-current converters, we actually saw two op amps in front. One op amp would be an inverting mixing stage, mixing control voltages, and the second would be necessary to undo that inversion so we could have a positive voltage at this base relative to ground. Here, Ine is taking a simpler approach. If you ignore for a second the small amount of current flowing through the base, we just have a resistive passive summing network here. And this is a little weird because, for instance, let's say you leave the pitch input here disconnected. And let's say you now walk up and put a patch cable into it, but don't put any signal into it yet. That essentially grounds the input. Well, those two cases are going to act differently. If this pitch input is grounded, the various other inputs here are going to see this 100K in parallel with this 1.8, which is going to look different than if you just leave this pitch input disconnected altogether. But... 100K in parallel with 1.8K is going to be pretty close to 1.8K. So I think by using a relatively small resistor here, you could probably put something into this input or not, and you wouldn't actually change the behavior too much, or at least to a degree that would be noticeable. Down here, he has a pot to set an overall offset. And up here, he has a couple of control voltages that come in. But unlike the pitch input here, these have some potentiometers that control the amount of influence these control voltages have. So the pitch input is probably coming from a keyboard, but these control voltages may be coming from envelopes or low-frequency oscillators. So let's dig into the filter core. Rene is using two CA30 OTAs. If you're building this now, I would recommend using the LM13700 because those are easier to find. He's using bog standard op amps as the voltage buffers. He's using 10K for our big and 220 ohm for our small with one nanofarad filter capacitors. There's a giant 47 microfarad cap sitting here to get rid of any DC offsets that might have built up. And here we have the resonance pot. If you have this turned all the way down, then there's no feedback, K equals zero. And this corresponds to just two first order filters cascaded. And that's the critically damp case where both of the poles are sitting at the same spot on the real axis. That corresponds to Q equal one half in the Bach version of the filter. Okay, now let's take a look at this op amp in the feedback loop. Let's ignore the diodes for a moment. We'll come back to those. We have a 10K feedback resistance and a 1.K resistance to ground. So let's pull out our calculator. 1 plus 10 divided by 1.8, which is around 6.6. Now, that's a little disturbing because earlier I told you that the Bach version of the... Go away, Johan. K needed to be less than 2. And here we're saying that if you have that pot turned all the way up, it's around 6.6. .6. So what gives? Well, Rene has put these back-to-back -back LEDs in the feedback loop of this op amp. And so when the voltage gets to be enough that those LEDs start to turn on, they'll start to conduct and effectively, the feedback resistance is lowered. Using different kinds of LEDs here and different numbers of LEDs will give you different characteristics. This non-inverting op-amp configuration with these diodes in the feedback loop is quite reminiscent of the Ibanez tube screamer. And you need some sort of non-linearity like this in the feedback loop 
to be able to achieve sustained self-oscillation at high cues if that's a thing that you want to do. Before we move on, let's pull out our calculator again and compute what the natural frequency of the filter would be. Okay, so let's compute some natural frequencies. Let's see, let's do one divided by two times pi times the capacitance, which would be one nanofarad. And in the numerator, we will have 19.2 times whatever the control current is. And I should emphasize that this is the control current going into one of the OTAs. Since there's two OTAs, the actual current generating circuitry will need to generate twice that. And let's see, we can build our R small over R big, so 220 ohm over 10 kilo ohm. So I put e to the three there. And what I want to do is actually take out this IABC, and that will just give us a constant that we multiply the current by to figure out what the natural frequency is. Okay, so we have this number, 6.7227 e to the plus 07 times, let's see, so one milliamp is probably the highest you would want to put into the OTA current control pin, and that would give us Whoop, no. <laughs> That's one kiloamp. Let's do a milliamp. All right, so 67 kilohertz. That's well above the threshold of human hearing. What if we just put in half of a milliamp? That would be around like 34 kilohertz. All right, what about something like a microamp? If we put in a microamp, that would give us 67 hertz. Okay, so that feels like a nice range of control currents that would map to reasonable frequencies. Oh, also notice that the input is going into the negative terminal here. So the entire structure is inverting, although don't read too much into that. That just puts a minus sign in front of the transfer function. Also, don't be thrown by this 220 ohm resistor. This is just balancing out non-ideal input currents of the OTA. For the purposes of our analysis, we can just imagine this is grounded. Okay, so here's the actual filter in the real Korg MS20. And it consists of two filters in series. The first one is a high-pass filter, although I'm putting high-pass in quotes here, and I'll explain later why I'm doing that. And the second is a low-pass filter, which corresponds to the filter by Rene that I just showed you. So let's see. The original Korg design uses 220 ohms for R small and 10 kilo ohms for R big, and that corresponds to what Rene did. Rene used a different value for the capacitors. He used 1 nanofarad, and here Korg is using 2.2 nanofarad. There's some other differences in terms of the buffers. Rene used op-amp buffers, whereas the actual Korg MS20 used the Darlington configuration buffers built into the 13600 OTA chip. The 13600 and the 13700 are different, but they're almost identical, and you could build this with a 13700 just fine. The 10K resistors to the negative rail are just there to help the NPN transistors in the Darlington configurations be buffers. Let's see what else. Oh, there's a big difference here. Rene used LEDs in the feedback loop, whereas here Korg is using three diodes in series, two pairs of this in a back-to-back -back configuration, which will provide a different flavor of distortion in the feedback loop and hence give the VCF a different characteristic sound. So notice in this low-pass filter, the input comes into the negative terminal of the first OTA, and there's a feedback loop that goes into this capacitor. There is a high-pass filter in front of this low-pass filter, but it's not strictly the canonical high-pass function we've always been looking at that had just the S squared in the numerator. To create this quote-unquote high-pass filter, they take the input and run it into the second capacitor that normally in the original circuit goes to ground. And then the terminal that originally had the input in the low-pass version, well, they just take that and ground it. 
Now, many years ago, I spent a ton of time deriving the transfer function for this, and I found that the resulting transfer function is actually a combination of our canonical high-pass and band-pass responses. So there's a term in the numerator with an S for the band-pass, and there's a term in the numerator with an S squared for the high-pass. Now you can actually build a strict high-pass voltage-controlled filter with just that S squared in the numerator, at least the Bach version of it, like we're doing here, using OTAs. And it starts from doing the same kind of transformations we did, placing resistors with OTAs, but you start with the high-pass version of this filter, which basically swaps the roles of the resistors and the capacitors. But that is not what Korg is doing here. This is something else. Now, the idea of taking a capacitor that was originally grounded and putting the input into it, and then taking the terminal that originally took in the input and grounding it, that makes sense as a thing to try. When we looked at one-pole voltage-controlled filters, we saw that, indeed, a standard RC filter can be converted from low-pass to high-pass just by swapping the roles of the input and the ground, and hence you can get a one-pole high-pass voltage-controlled filter made with an OTA from a low-pass voltage-controlled filter made with an OTA design, but the solid key is a more intricate structure. Oh, now something interesting. Let's redo this calculation we had up here using the 2.2 nanofarad capacitor that the original Korg design uses. So that gives us this kind of factor. So essentially that 2.2 nanofarad is around twice the one nanofarad that Rene used. So basically all of our numbers would be cut by around half. So if I put one microamp in, that would give us a 30 hertz cutoff. If you would like to dig into this more, I highly recommend you go to Tim Stinchcomb's website and get a hold of the paper he wrote called A Study of the Korg MS-10 and MS-20 Filters. It is really amazing in terms of how thorough this analysis is. Now, in addition to analyzing the OTA-based circuit we just looked at, there are earlier versions of the MS-20 that use this weird thing called the Korg 35 chip. And this version essentially uses BJTs as variable resistors in the solid key formulation. It's a deeply weird design that I haven't looked at in detail myself. But Tim has, so you should definitely go check out his analysis. I think one fundamental difference is there isn't really a buffer sitting here, so this is not the Bach version of the filter. I think this is closer to the original solid key, but, I mean, using BJTs as variable resistors, that's just going to have all kinds of weirdness on its own. So here's an example of a low-pass solid key filter design from the SSM 2040 datasheet. We'll also look at a high-pass and band-pass design from the same datasheet. To my knowledge, these didn't appear in any commercial products, and for that matter, I would be surprised if anyone ever built this, including the people including the people who designed the SSM 2040, because remember, the 2040 has all four of its OTAs being driven by the exact same current. So this would only really be useful if you really wanted another low-pass solid key filter that was set to the exact same natural frequency. Now we're going into the negative pin of this first OTA, so that suggests that this is going to be an overall inverting configuration, but a bit of a spoiler alert, there's going to be a plot twist there. And there's a challenge in implementing the solid key filter with the 2040. We need both the negative and the positive input of this OTA, but the SSM 2040 has all of its positive OTA inputs wired internally to ground. So what they wind up doing in the 2040 data sheet is they actually take what's going to the positive input here and they shove it into the negative input instead. So the design on the second OTA winds up sharing R small between the two inputs the same way we wound up sharing these R smalls when we went to the inverting configuration. But because this is now going into the negative terminal instead of a positive terminal, they wind up having to use an op amp in an inverting configuration over here in order to get the correct sign in the feedback loop back to this CF, as we called it. And it turns out then that the transfer function for the low-pass filter output 
doesn't have that minus sign. Since although we're going into the inverting input here, we're hitting the inverting input here as well. So unlike in all the other sell and key designs we've looked at so far, these wind up canceling, which is why there's not a negative sign in front of the transfer function of the sell and key low pass in this table from the data sheet. The high pass filter from the data sheet needs to use this inverting configuration as well to deal with the fact that we don't have access to this positive terminal in here. And this is a real canonical high pass function with an S squared in the numerator. So this is not like that combination band pass high pass response we got from the MS20 interpretation of high pass. I'm not actually aware of any commercial synthesizer that uses a true solid and key high pass filter, but there are state variable high pass filters in things like the Yamaha CS80. The data sheet also has a solid key bandpass filter. You can look up the original solid and key bandpass filter designs in various books and app notes and such. I won't get into it here and do the kind of substitutions of resistors by OTAs that we've been doing and get something like this. The only bandpass filter I'm aware of with a solid and key structure is in the Yamaha GX1. There's a bandpass filter with a fixed Q that's basically used to pull out various harmonics in a waveform. Although the voltage controlled aspect is implemented very differently in that filter, the GX1 filters use these weird diode bridge configurations.